Welcome to another interview. This is Representative Ben Davis from Minnesota, and I was so appreciative that he granted this interview. And I'm gonna let this short video clip of him on the House floor tell you a little bit more about him. He's an amazing, upright man of God. So hit the subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and I hope you enjoy the interview. This is America. We are the United States of America. And we have these great freedoms that was paid for by precious blood. The blood of patriots. And we have an opportunity, representatives, to stop the madness. We can lead when it comes to freedoms in Minnesota. Minnesota can be a leader in the United States of America. People can look to Minnesota and go, look at Minnesota, man. They protect constitutional rights that are God-given. I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, Lord, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my host is prayer. I will worship you, Lord, until the very end. And I pray that we would always respond to your love. Thank you, God. Your presence is amazing. This is awesome. This is. Thank you for doing this interview. Yeah. This is great. It's good to be here, my friend. Yeah, I'm so excited. And I'm, I'm really grateful because I know that revelation comes from you. Because, you know, you were my first counselor, really, you know, after me coming to Jesus. And um, there was a lot of things. And, you, you know, it, it's... In, in the first year or so, uh, you, you know, you can't communicate everything, but there's a lot of things where, you know, I, the foundation of my faith, you know, it's been really blessed by you. And I just, I really appreciate it. And I, I just thank you, you know, and, and, and one of those things is being involved in uh, awareness of knowing what's going on in the world. Because early on, I was so legalistic in my faith mm. that I thought I shouldn't even watch the news. You know, yeah. I shouldn't even, you know, watch an award show. And, and some award shows you shouldn't watch as a Christian, probably. Right. But. but that's part of the process. As a passionate Christian, God walks us through that. You know, we yeah. all, because why were you like that? Because you wanted to please your master. You wanted to please your Lord. Yeah. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just thank you so much for doing this interview. I yeah. Just, I really appreciate it. Um, and so... Representative Minnesota State Representative. I know it's Ben crazy. Davis. <laughs> um, I did not see that call coming uh, three years ago. If you told me that I was going to be a state representative in Minnesota, um, I would have said you're crazy. I might have rebuked the devil out of you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't have done that. But um, I would have thought you were crazy, and um, it, it would it would have just been time for us to move on in that conversation. But um, sometimes God has a way of surprising us. And uh, Psalm 37 says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart. Mm. And uh, to me, I, I interpret that as he's not just going to give me whatever I want. It's as I delight myself in him, he like shapes and molds. He gives me the desires of my heart. Mm. Like he's molding mm -hmm. certain desires that he wants accomplished here on earth. Ah. And, um, you know, our flesh doesn't always like to serve God, but if we're delighting ourselves in Jesus, our spirit is excited mm. uh, to serve Jesus. Mm. So, yeah, I didn't see that one coming. Um, and I, I know I'm kind of going on here, but do you, do you want me to go into that? Like, you can go into it. Yeah, we can go wherever. Okay, yep. well, why don't I start here? I, I, uh, I'll, just so your audience knows a little bit about me, I did not grow up a Christian. I was an atheist. I became an atheist. Um, I was a theist growing up. My mom and dad taught me that there was a God, but we didn't go to church, you know, on Easter once in a while. And um, I was taught uh, um, Darwinian evolution in school. 
mm-hmm. and I was taught it as fact. And so I guess that kind of became my religion. And um, I believe there was a God, but maybe he just used Darwinian evolution. I remember in fourth grade, I picked up the Word of God. I picked up the Bible uh, to read it, and I got through the first two pages, and I put it down, and my attitude was, I'm not going to read that garbage. That's not truth. They're teaching me truth <laughs> in public school. Mm. And... Um, so anyway, that you know, eventually that led me into some trouble. I, I I'm very I, I have a very experimental personality, and uh, I believe it was right around 13, 14 years old. I started uh, nipping at my dad's Jack Daniels, you know, and um, uh, that led into you know, 15, 16 years old, right around there. I started uh, dabbling with marijuana, and I was already a uh, I chewed. I was already a tobacco addict, yep. uh, nicotine addict. And um, anyway, I, I'll, I'll try to make a long story short here. But I became a, a addict of marijuana uh, from the age of 17 to 24. Mm-hmm. And uh, marijuana is a highly addictive drug. And um, it just is. And it certainly was for me. And then um, I got free from that. This This atheist who hated religion got stuck working with a Christian one day at work. Um, I was in the forest product industry and I got stuck working with a Christian and um, he was the real deal. And he loved me with the love of Jesus. He met me right where I was at in my life. He didn't condemn me for the way I was living my life. And Hmm. listen, I had way more addictions, way more serious addictions than marijuana in my life. I would do just about any drug I could get my hand on. Um, I was terrible to my wife. My wife was ready to divorce me. Uh, after a year of being married and uh, we had had our first child out of wedlock and uh, Cassandra God bless her uh, she's awesome um, but anyway this guy showed me the love of Jesus and he led me to Jesus I don't know what it was about that day I do know what it was it was the Holy Spirit uh, opening my eyes to truth mm. and uh, he told me about Jesus Christ and he led me to Jesus like I was a lost little puppy and um, I can remember coming home that, that afternoon and my wife was uh, cooking supper and she was, I can still see, she was grounding hamburger. And I can even, it's vivid, I can see the steam coming up off the hamburger when I told her uh, she was the first person outside of the guy that led me to the Lord, the first person I confessed my faith to. I said, honey, I'm going to be a Christian now. <laughs> and she looked up at me. And she's a she was a backslidden Assemblies of God girl who ended up with me. <laughs> and uh, anyway, she looked up at me, and I'll never forget. She just said, "Okay," and she put her head back down. And I remember it's going to bring tears to my eyes. I remember the look in her face, like, "How much damage have I done to this woman? Mm-hmm. You know, how much damage have I done to her?" I could just see it in her because now I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I had God's mm-hmm. eyes in me, you know, yeah. looking at her. And, um, yeah, and so I surrendered my life to Jesus, but I started living it and cha- making changes in my life, and she saw that. And, uh, she, like I said, she was ready to divorce me after about a month. She was even more ready to divorce me <laughs> because now I'm chasing her around with the Bible, telling her scripture. And she's like, I know that, I know that. But she then surrendered her life to Jesus. And mm. from there, our relationship, because we were both seeking Jesus now, our relationship took off wow and we've been married for for 23 years <laughs> um and uh uh time flies but it's it gets better and better now every year in my marriage yeah and uh we get closer and closer and when i think i can't get closer with my wife in in a relationship in a friendship uh jesus surprised me and shows me you know there's there's much there's mm. there's a, a deeper place i i want to bring you to and that's the way our relationship is with him he's always got a deeper place of surrender to bring us to mm. and what i've uh, noticed is it's amazing how patient he is with us god absolutely is love and he is mm. to be feared he is to be feared because he's getting god wisdom. i heard pastor tony evans say that the fear of God is basically this, treating God as God. Mm. And when you say it, it just makes sense when you say yeah. it like that. And um, But he is he is love. That's what he is. Um, I, I kind of got sidetracked there. But um, so fast forward, I, I get free from drugs and alcohol. Um, I, I really wasn't an alcoholic, but I just, I quit doing that. And, um, but I quit doing drugs. 
Um, fast forward a few years later, I got a job at Teen Challenge, Minnesota Adult and Teen mm-hmm. Challenge at the Central Campus. And um, God led me into that and put me in a position of leadership. And um, they basically gave me a curriculum and told me, here you go, you're going to start teaching this stuff. I'm like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> but I learned real quick that God equips the called. You know, mm. Sometimes he calls the equipped too, mm-hmm. but a lot of times he equips the called. Mm-hmm. And, then, uh, and that's where I got to meet you, my brother in yeah. Christ, and um, got to help got to partner with God in changing lives. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that changes lives. The first time I ever went to church, I was nine years old. The first time that I can remember. And it was upstairs at the Remnants, and you taught the class. Wow. And we wrote Genesis 1-1 on this popsicle stick. And that was the thing, and you, and you were talking about Genesis 1-1. Wow. And I was either nine or ten years old because it was... Just a year after my parents had divorced, my mom had remarried, mm. and then Cliff was my stepdad. You know, that's who my mom remarried. And then we, we started going there, and I was having a lot of, I was doing really stupid things, even as a nine, ten year old. And, and yeah, Brian had seen me a couple of times, counsel, you know, and everything. Yeah. But, Pastor Brian, the yeah, founder Pastor of Brian. the church, yeah. Yep, yep. yep. And uh, you were the teacher of the Sunday school, the first time I ever went to any kind of Sunday school or anything, you know, so. Wow. Yeah, so you have these... I didn't know that. <laughs> and it's, it, it's so interesting, too, because there's just like these foundational things in my faith that we're, God has really blessed me with your faith. And then really, I just want to circle back around. So I don't know if you can share his whole name, probably not, but um, the guy that ministered to you and witnessed to you. Oh, that, yeah. What was yeah. his first name? Mark. Mark. Yeah, so I... Mark, if you listen to this, I just want, want to tell you how beautiful it is and to, to encourage anybody else preach the gospel no matter where you are what you're doing preach the gospel because now we have a christian in minnesota politics influencing people for christ yeah i'm a content creator and now now i'm interviewing you right and it's just a beautiful it's beautiful how god ordains things in his kingdom as stepping stones and and he he calls the equipped but most of the time he just equips the call yep and i feel like uh just in the last year or two i've realized how powerful that weak yes is. Just that, you know, if, if you can tell he's calling you into something, which I'm sure Mark was called into ministering to you, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it, that was a, a yes too. He was know, just, just a faithful man who worked hard uh, in this industry, in the forest products industry, and he was just faithful in sharing his his uh, testimony with me and sharing with me about Jesus. And it's, I think it's going to be people like that, that are the red, the red carpet's going to be rolled out for in heaven, mm. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so fast forward, I, I worked, I worked at Teen Challenge for 12 years. Um, I became a past, I became a chaplain at Teen Challenge right around the same time. I became a pastor, uh, became ordained by uh, IMF and um, I started pastoring and um, I was very content doing that, pastoring. I loved it. Uh, because again, if you delight yourself in the Lord, you're going to want to do what God wants you to do, what he's putting on your heart to do. And, um, and then, so then I'll fast forward here. To why did I get involved? Polit- I've always, Chris, I've always kind of paid attention politically, but I never really got involved Um and that's what we all need to start doing. We all start. We all need to start getting involved. And I'm going to go into why soon here. But I'm going to let you okay. ask your questions first. But how did I get involved in becoming a state rep? I uh, uh, 2020 COVID shutdown. Governor Walls. He demanded that we shut down our businesses, our schools, and our churches. And um, I'm going, this isn't right. Why does Walmart get to be labeled as essential? But yet mom and uh, mom and pop down the road, their business has to shut down. They're not essential, even though that business is essential to their livelihood. And the government came in and said, we will take care of you. We'll give you payments. And, and surely it wasn't enough 
they weren't going to supplement people's actual income, what they were making in their businesses, many of them. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've had so many businesses close and shut down. Many of the rest in the restaurant business Mm. couldn't open again. They just couldn't afford it. They lost their livelihoods. And he says, uh, you you got to shut down your churches. And and, um, I'm going, and at first I'll confess, for like the first month we did online church because we no one knew what COVID was really going to do, what it was really all about. You know, we had been given these videos by the mainstream media showing Chinese people dropping dead in the street or falling over. Yeah. And um, and we're going, oh my gosh, what is this? And so, just as a precaution, uh, for about a month, we just did online church. And then when we started realizing, like even people in our church at home were getting it and they weren't dropping dead. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. some people did die. Mm-hmm. And that's unfortunate. We lost a, a, an uncle that was very dear to us on my wife's side. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't killing people like they said it was gonna kill people. Mm-hmm. And we're like, and then someone, what did it was someone, one of my uh, uh, folks that goes to the church, a young man, he says, man, you're doing these online uh, church sessions. Can I can I just come and be there and sit there? I really need the fellowship. Mm-hmm. And that was it for me. I'm like, that's it. We're done. It's time to get back in the pews. People are struggling. Mm-hmm. And I'm not being a good shepherd right now. And we cannot operate out of fear. And so that's how we operated moving forward. And um, we started having church. And then... After that, Governor Wall said, "No, you got to shut down your churches." And I just something mm. didn't sit right with me in my spirit, mm-hmm. um, because and I had taught this at Teen Challenge, Romans thirteen one, you know, all, uh, Romans thirteen, all authority. submit to the governing authority for mm. all authority comes from God. Yeah. And but something what I kept looking at that scripture and I'm going, what is going on here, God? And and God began ministering, Son, I want you to obey me first and foremost. Now, did I hear a voice saying that? No, but that's what was in my heart. It's like, I got to obey you, God. God, you call us to fellowship. You call us to go to church. That's more important than what Governor Walls is. I have to obey yeah. you above Governor Walls. So there's a higher authority there mm-hmm. to submit to, God Almighty. And um, and so that caused me to really start paying attention. And long story short, I, uh, I started leading this group of uh, conservative Christians um, we, uh, gosh, we grew to like 200 folks on our email list. And on a typical, we met once a week. We had a lot of times over 100 folks in the room. So people were waking up. And I started leading that group. It was actually a product of Restore Minnesota and Dale Witherington, a wonderful man of God that ministers to many people down at the state legislature. Mm. Uh, he kind of handed it off to me because he was traveling up from the cities leading this group. Um, and it was just normal, regular people, Christians. And um, so we just had redistricting uh, come out in um, 2022. And the morning after redistricting, I had met this gentleman who eventually became my campaign manager. His name's Dan. And, and Dan had been in the, he's a Christian man, but he'd been highly involved in politics for many years. And uh, the morning after redistricting happened, it was like this district was carved out right mm. in the middle of it's Minnesota. Nice. And uh, it was, I lived in it, and there was no sitting representation in the district. So the district was wide open. Mm. And he called me up and he said, Ben, you know, redistricting just came out this morning. I said, Yep, yep, I, I haven't looked at it yet. And he says, Well, you and I don't have any sitting, and we live in the same district, we don't have any sitting representation. And I said to him, Dan, you should run. And he says, Ben, I thought about that for five minutes, and then it came to me after I prayed, you should run. (laughs) The rest is history. Um, I won the endorsement from the Republican Party, and I just spoke from my heart about God and government Mm. and how that is the authority that God has set up in this nation God and government. And government is to come under. We are one nation mm-hmm. under God. Yep. And even our Declaration of Independence acknowledges that we have a creator and that we are all created equal. Not mm-hmm. born equal, yeah. created equal. Yeah. Maybe we'll touch on that more later too. 
and um, and uh, on the, I had two other opponents, and on the first ballot of, of uh, voting, I won. Um, you, you needed to get 60% of the vote. I got 60% of the six, almost 61% of the vote. And uh, then I went on and, and defeated a, a Democrat opponent. And I got endorsed by the Republican Party because I'm a Christian. And um, I was looking at the, I mean, it's just a, the truth. And I'm not a neoconservative. I'm not a neocon. I'm not a warmongering conservative. I'm just, I'm like a, 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 an old school conservative. You mm-hmm. know, I believe in the Constitution. Yeah. I believe that our rights are God-given, not government-given. So that makes me conservative in my values and in my beliefs. And um, there's two major political parties, and only one of them endorses people with that viewpoint. And so that's why I went to achieve the Republican endorsement. Hmm. And I I won the election by uh, 25 points, and uh, the rest is history. Now I find myself not just preaching from the pulpit, but uh, preaching from the Minnesota House floor. Uh, to a bunch of people that praise think, God to a bunch of people that think I'm crazy. So there, there. Long story. I'm sorry, but there it is. Wow. It's interesting too that you you say, well, you went from preaching from the pulpit to pre- preaching at the Capitol. It's really interesting because one of the questions I had prepared was, how was being a pastor, or being a counselor, how did that prepare you for politics? Because one thing that stood out for me is that you demand that the people listening to you are in attention, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I love, I love uh, this video right here, actually. When we've got a $17.5 billion surplus, we're increasing tax, $52 billion budget increased to a $72 billion budget, 50, or 40% increase, 43, sorry. And we're moving towards a $100 billion budget at lightning speed. In Minnesota, that's what we're moving towards, folks. A $100 billion budget. It's time for us to wake up. When does the spending stop? When do the increases stop? And I don't know what you're thinking, but I I just can't help. And maybe I'll get ruled out of order for saying this. I don't know. But this is just what's burning in my heart. Just a thought I'm wrestling with. Are we trying to move towards socialism? Wow, some of the looks on your face is just, well, I'll move on. Well, I will say this. There's only one way that you can hold a nation accountable for socialism. And it's not through a representative democracy and it's not through a constitutional republic. There's only one way you can enforce socialism. And that's through communism. Keep laughing. It's fine. We are doing this at a time when Minnesota struggles. You know, Ronald Reagan uh, said this. I love Ronald Reagan. I hope many in this room do love Ronald Reagan. Um, Man, he was a very popular president. You know, in, in 1984, he won all 50... Oh, wait, no, wait. No, he didn't win all 50 states. Wait, there was one state he didn't win. But I think he won the rest of them. I'll, I'll let you figure out which state didn't vote for him. Ronald Reagan, one of my childhood heroes, said this, government is not a solution to our problem. Government is the problem. I'll repeat that. Government is not a solution to our problem. Government is the problem. You're, you're in front of these politicians, you know, and you stop and you bang the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That was an interesting <laughs> moment there. I couldn't believe, afterwards, I couldn't believe I did that, so... It's so interesting, though, because right now in politics, especially in Minnesota, that's what needs to happen because those who have ears to hear, you know, there, there's a lot of people that have been elected. They don't even have ears to hear their own constituents, the people that voted for them. You know, there's chaos in the streets in Minneapolis every day, every day. As a person that goes into these encampments, as a person that ministers on the street, the fentanyl epidemic is literally killing people every day in Minnesota. And it's so sad. And and two, the open border policies that we have right now with this administration. uh, And two, there's a lot of, you know, uh, they say there's Hamas coming over the border too. You know, so that that adds to sleeper cells. That adds to all this different stuff going on. Um, 
And I just, I, I wanted to touch a little bit and just ask you, because you kind of answered the how, how being a pastor and a, and a counselor, uh, even though I didn't even ask it, praise God. But your father was a, is a vet. Yeah. And could you just talk a little bit about him and how having him as a dad has, has prepared you also? Yeah, my dad served um, um, uh, over in Korea. Uh, he wasn't in the Korean War. This was after the Korean War, but he served over in Korea. And he doesn't talk about what they did over there, but he served over uh, at the DMV. Or the DMV. The DMZ. DMZ. Yes. Uh, at the, he served at the DMZ. And um, he really instilled in me this principle of respecting your elders. He really did. And um, respecting our veterans, honoring our veterans, and always honoring. In fact, that's that's one of my taglines. I've got a sign that says, honor our veterans always. Mm. And um, I, I like to bring that sign out at parades and stuff. And, and I like to put veterans um, on my uh, uh, on my. Um, Parade ride. What do you? I, I can't think of the word right now. Uh, the tra- I'm sorry. The parade trailer. Oh. We like to put veterans on the parade trailer, and really honor them, and mm-hmm. uh, show that this is how we're to treat those who have served to give their lives, and many of them have have lost friends who have lost their lives, and so I, I, I I'm very grateful. Um, you know, my dad and I we had an interesting relationship growing up. Uh, I won't go into that, but one thing he instilled in me was respecting your elders and respecting uh, the military and law enforcement. Uh, Mm. During my years of addiction, I will be the first to confess, I really got far away from that. But, um, um, you know, when I came back to G, when I came to Jesus, actually, let me say that when I came to Jesus, not when I came back to Jesus, when I came to Jesus, it was amazing how that, 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 uh, uh, character that my dad had instilled me came right back Mm. and um you know proverbs teaches uh solomon wrote that and he said my son listen to my teachings it's like it's a father talking to his son Mm. uh for Mm -hmm. they will be a garland around your neck you know and uh it was like god put that garland right back around my heart uh, of having that respect for your elders and that honoring veterans and honoring law enforcement because they put their lives on the line for us. And yeah, um, yeah they deserve a lot of honor and respect. So th- th- about my dad, my dad um, got saved himself sometime after I got saved. He's actually goes to my church now. You got to meet yeah, him. Yeah, got to meet him. Uh, he's 83 years old. Wow. And um, yep, and uh, he's, he's a huge blessing uh, in my life, so. Yeah, I have a very good relationship with my dad. Now we talk, sometimes we talk two to three times on the phone. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Wow, that's great. That is great. <clears throat> so as far as the Republican Party in Minnesota, um, what is the future of the Republican Party in Minnesota? What does it look like, uh, you know, in, in four years, five years? Because we're in a... Blue state. Well, I can tell you what I hope it looks like, but mm-hmm. right now what it looks like. Um, so we just had with redistricting uh, from the 2020 census taking place in 2022, uh, we had redistricting. And um, I can tell you this group of freshman legislature legislators who have come in, I believe we had, oh boy, I think it's 24 in the Republican side just come in and they're firebrands, man. Um, And they are uh, folks who have strong character. And most of them got involved because they were concerned about the direction of their country. And that's Mm. that's why I got involved too, you know. I I mean, God's the one that led me into it. God put these things on my heart. But I was concerned about the direction of our country. And I was concerned about the future of my children. What kind of America... Are my children going to grow up in? That means something to me because I grew up in an America where liberty and freedom. I, I you know, when I was a kid, Ronald Reagan uh, was the president of the United States. And he wasn't a perfect man, but he had this country behind him. And um, you know, some people might might uh, say that American pride is is not a good thing. And I know during that time, there's people that have very different upbringing than me. But I can just tell you. 
um, when I grew up, America was special and people came here because America was special and America still was this land of opportunity. And in, uh, you know, the 70s were tough and into the beginning of the 80s, we had financial uh, hardships in America, but Ronald Reagan made some tough decisions and that brought forth some great prosperity in America. We just had to wait a little bit for it. And we saw that later into the 80s and into mm. the 90s, America was absolutely prospering, mm. absolutely prospering. And um, I believe that God wants every sovereign nation to seek him and to prosper. And I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. I'm not. I think um, when we just put a focus on on the gospel being prosperity, y you get off. Just like if you just focus the gospel on healing, or if you just focus the gospel in one area, absolutely, you 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 can get if you just focus the gospel on holiness, which we're all the focus on holiness. But when you just focus on that, that that's the only way I can mm. please the Lord. What do we do? We get legalistic. You know, mm. and so um, Paul said, I, I preach the whole gospel. I preach to you the whole counsel of God. Mm. And so we've got to uh, bring the whole counsel of God together. And, and I'm sorry I got sidetracked there, but That's great. I'm not a prosperity preacher or teacher, but I do believe that God wants us to prosper. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wants us to work hard with our hands. That's actually what the Bible teaches. Yeah. And he will bless us if we do that, mm -hmm. if we're working unto God and not unto man. I mean, yeah. if you work for God, you're going to work a lot harder, you know, yeah. than you would be if well, I'm just working for man. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible teaches, that we're to work hard with our hands. And so I believe yeah. God wants to bless us and prosper us. And I believe he wants to prosper each sovereign nation. And he wants each sovereign nation to seek him and to prosper, and what does the scripture say? Prosper even as their soul prospers. Mm. I think that's what God wants for America. Yeah, absolutely. I, I heard an interesting take on X.com today. Uh, Jeremy Boring, he's the, uh, him and Ben Shapiro are the founders of Daily Wire. And, but Jeremy Boring isn't on camera a lot. He's kind of the behind the scenes guy. And he tweeted out on X.com and he said, there's nothing in the Bible that says that a Christian should be in poverty. You know, like that's not, you know, and so I hear exactly Correct. what you're saying as, as far as like, yeah, if you just focus, there's also a lot of ministers who just focus on deliverance. And I would say that that's not the right way either. It should be, it should be whatever the Holy Spirit wants to use you in, in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. And you he know, may give you a ministry of deliverance, but he's also got many things for you to focus on. He doesn't on. want you to lay hands on people and heal them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's like, you have to, you have to be open and in surrender to let the Holy Spirit use you. Right. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm a pastor. I focus on uh, my flock at, at Remnant Ministry Center. But God called me also into government. I could have easily gotten, no, 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 no. I'm called to be a shepherd over Remnant Ministry Center. Um, I don't have time for that. I'm too focused on this. And I would have missed the call of God. Mm. And right now he's got me doing both. And it's actually working out very good. Mm. I'm really busy. Uh, but I've got a great wife, <laughs> and that really helps. Um, but yeah, it's like we can get so focused on one thing that it can take our eyes off of something that God might also have for us over here. Mm -hmm. And one thing I noticed is the more you use God's gifts, the more gifts and talents you find out that he's given you. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's biblical. You know, Jesus spoke a whole parable on talents. talents. Yeah, you absolutely. got it. And the one who had gained... Uh, five talents, give them five more. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the one who had gained two, give them two more. Mm. Um, but the one who buried it, uh, went and hid it in the sand or whatever he do, he and, got beat. buried it and put it in a handkerchief and buried it and said, "Well, I was just here. I'm going to give it back to you." You didn't. The Lord called him a wicked, lazy servant. Wow. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Like it was his servant, and he called him a wicked, lazy servant. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I don't want my Lord no. to call me a wicked, lazy servant. No. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter yeah. into thy rest. Yeah. Yeah, I think, too, even even the, you know, the the parable of the sower, you could even argue that a hundredfold, you know, is, well, it's got to grow up and there's fruit, you know. And, yeah, it's maybe that's a little bit of a stretch. But <laughs> uh, no. I think there's a lot of biblical argument to be made that, yeah, God will bless you. Uh, in accordance to your surrender, 
Yeah, and, and here's another thing. I, I don't want us to get legalistic with that either because mm-hmm. what it was the Lord, the Lord called him a wicked, lazy servant because he did nothing with it mm. but buried it. Mm. And what did the Lord tell him? If you would have just done the minimal mm. with it, I would have received it back with interest. It would have produced something if you would have just taken the minimum thing wow. you could have done, the minimal thing you could have done. It would have produced something, and and I'm glad you brought up that. I, I think that was divine. You brought that up, uh, the 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 hundredfold, the bearing the fruit. Some some bear thirty, some bear sixty, some bear a hundredfold. Oh yeah. Fold. Yep. Um, I think it depends on how um, hard we work with what God gives us, how much mm. fruit it's going to bear. And if mm. we would just put forth even some effort, it's going to bear fruit. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, let me ask too, with the, and it was kind of a good segue, is the parable of the sower, you know, you have uh, the seed that falls on the path and all this, and it's basically the enemy, you know, you know, the four different seeds, the four different, it, 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 but it's the three that don't produce, it's the enemy, stealing things away, getting them convinced of greed or all this stuff. And let me getting ask. Getting our focus on the cares of this life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> let me ask, when you, when you felt the call, when you had that conversation with Dan, is his name, campaign yeah. manager? We had that conversation, and he and he wanted you to do it. You know, um, was there opposition? Was there people in your life that said, "Oh no, you shouldn't do this. You gotta." Yeah, yeah, there was, and it came from directions that I didn't expect. It actually came mm. from close spiritual mentors, mm. who I think they were just concerned about me, and um, I, so I think they were well-meaning, but I don't mm. think they sought the Lord. Mm. on on how they should have supported me and uh there's one in particular i'm thinking of who does now support me now today i think that person can clearly see that oh wow that this is what god has called mm-hmm. him into um and and that, that's another thing like i submit myself to my spiritual elders i really do um you know you wage war a good war by wise counsel Absolutely, and uh, and to me that what that means is you know we're we're in the spiritual war. Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and evil darkness. That's yeah. what we wrestle against. So we're in this war in this life, mm-hmm. and um, and so we need spiritual mentors. We really do. It's important. Um, you know, Paul had Timothy. Paul also had Titus. You know, um, mm. so um, it's very important. But however, we also have to acknowledge they're not always going to be the voice of God for us. They're going to get it wrong too. Mm -hmm. Like, do we ever get it wrong? Like, Oh God, I thought you were telling me this and man, I was wrong. I, I, I I messed up here, Lord. And, Mm -hmm. and um, that's happened to me many times, but again, the Lord is patient. And so we can't rely on our spiritual mentors to be the voice of God for us. We've got to seek God. Mm. And, and again, it goes back to Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord. If we're serving Jesus, we better be paying attention to the desires that are going on in our heart uh, because if they're wholly just and good, they're from Him. Mm. And mm. if we ignore that, oh, we can't. We can't. We can't do that. Huh. So, so yes, to answer your question, there were those who didn't want me doing this, but um, I, I, didn't, I didn't say this, but even before that happened, like I was originally going to run for county commissioner. Oh, and um, I'm on the phone with a representative right next door to me, uh, Josh Heinzman. And um, this was uh, about, I don't know, eight months, I think, before I actually got endorsed or maybe even close to a year. Uh, anyway, the timeline's a little fuzzy there, but I called him up and I just said, Josh, um, how did you get involved with politics? And he, he explained his story and he said, why do you ask? And I said, well, someday down the road, years down the road, I'm kind of feeling drawn to run for some type of public office and I just don't know how to do it. I don't know how to get involved. I've never done this before. And he said to me, I would encourage you not to wait and do it as soon as possible. And then he tried talking me into running for senator. (laughs) So uh, anyway, um, and I didn't bite on that. uh, But then, yeah, it was months later that the redistricting happened. And and, um, so Dan said to me, 
um, you should run. I said, well, I need to pray on it. I took about a week to pray on it. And it's like from that point on, the stars just kind of aligned. You know that old saying, the stars kind of aligned. Mm -hmm. And uh, the door blew wide open for me. And, and here I am. And how, how much was an encouragement? He, he really thought that you should run for senator? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it sounds yeah. like a sounds like a Bartholomew. It sounds like an encourager to me. Just somebody that's just, just yeah, to yeah, yeah. encourage. You yeah. know, that's that's. Awesome. Um, I, I will tell you this too. Um, there there are a lot of good folks that we've got serving in the state of Minnesota, in that House of Representatives, and in the Senate. There really are good people there who are fighting for our values, and you know, um, politics can be dirty. And when uh, politicians make mistakes, why would we think they wouldn't make mistakes? Especially in that um, oh, high stress of an environment. Yeah. And it's like, and wow. we should have a high stand. Uh, don't get me wrong. We should have a high standard of our politicians, our government leaders. Um, we should. Uh, our excuse me, our representatives and our senators. We need to have a high standard of them, but also. Jesus calls us to have grace with people. So why wouldn't we have that with politicians too? And I, I think of us folks on the conservative side, you know, we're very principled people and we end up attacking our own because they don't do something we like. And it's like this person may, agree, we may agree on 90% of the policies that we want to see get done, but we get so hung up on the 10% that we don't agree mm. on that we we don't support that person mm. and the other side of the aisle who i believe is being led by evil and we can get into that too who's absolutely being led by evil they stick together because if there's one thing that evil understands is that a house divided will fall mm. and we wow. as as uh, uh, uh people who are fighting for what's good and that, that, you know, uh, might not just be conservatives, but people just fighting for what is right. It's like we've got to learn to stick together. Good folks have got to learn to stick together mm -hmm. and not stab each other in the back and to be patient with one another and try to communicate and have conversation with one another. Mm -hmm. wow. um, the Lord actually addresses unity a lot. It's pleasing to him, you know. Under his standards, but it's pleasing to him. Yeah, and let him. me circle around too. Um, Reagan, that was a landslide. Yeah. You know, and, and I think sometimes was it that unity where everybody came together? I mean, it was a lance. Was it the most lance? I mean, it's, there was only one state that didn't vote him in. Which that is unprecedented in in Do you know American what state politics. That was? Was it Minnesota? It was Minnesota. Really? <laughs> yeah. Shame on you, Minnesota. Shame on you. Ronald Reagan won California, you know. And so, didn't win Minnesota. Did not win Minnesota. So I think that uh, talks Walter about... Walter Mondale was, was from Minnesota. Oh, so, and he was running, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. I, you know, anyway, regardless. Wow. We'll move on, but but I, I've thought about that because Reagan is, is such an interesting, you know, study for me. You know, it's like, was it that unity... Because everybody kind of decided, besides Minnesota, yeah. you know, this is going to be our leader and we're going to follow, you know, and, and it, some of these ideas might be radical, it might be risky, um, but it, it, there was a lot of unity in our country during yeah. that time. And, yeah. and I feel like that that's kind of what blessed his presidency, too. Mm -hmm. And and two, so many people love Reagan. I mean, it's just, it, it's just huge. Yeah, he was, he was a, himself a uniter. And I think also back then it was a lot easier for Democrats and Republicans um, to try and get along back then. It was just a different age, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I think we would do well to get back to that that heart. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, too, is, you know, when I look at just politics as uh, this overarching societal structure, it to me, it comes down to a worldview. You know, there's a lot of. I'll tell you what, you know, I mean, say what you want. We'll probably have to edit this out for some platforms. But, you know, today when the House Speaker, you know, which praise God that Mike Johnson is now the House Speaker. Um, but Angie Craig, she stands up and says, happy anniversary to my wife, Jeffries. You know, she takes her little five seconds to. And, and it's just one of those things where to me, it's heartbreaking because 
I understand the blessing of biblical marriage. I understand the blessing of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even any older people out there who have never got married, if you're Christian, try to find your anointed, ordained husband or wife because it's a totally different life. It's, a, it's such a blessing. I feel like I went from being a child to being an adult, even though I got married when I was, you know, 33. And, and two, it's really interesting. And I just real quick want to say, um, while we're talking about, you know, these different politicians on, on the left, uh, Governor Tim Walls, you know, on December 12th of 2020, he tried making it so that there was only 50 people that could be in any establishment. That was the day I married my wife. Yeah. And we had around 100 people at church. Yeah. And take that because we were not going to yeah. allow this politician to not let us get married. And 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 we I asked her to marry me in September and none of this stuff was going on and then it just so turns out that that day he tried to stop our our wedding and praise God for the courage and, did, and wisdom of the church leadership to allow it to happen. And, and did God bless it? Absolutely. He. I mean, let's get into why God. Well, why God blessed it. I mean, it's awesome. You married uh, the woman that God put in your life that you love and adore. That in and of itself is a huge blessing. He who finds a good wife receives a huge blessing mm. from the Lord, and you found a good one, a great one. Yeah. And um, praise God for that. God also blessed it uh, because you. There are God-given rights. And he was blessed to see you ignore that evil mandate of how many people? 50. Yeah, see. Well, that, no, it was 50. On the 12th, it was going down to 25. Yeah, see, see, he doesn't have the authority. He can pretend he has that In authority. In church. Yeah, he doesn't have that authority. because, and, and the Constitution just declares it to us. It tells us what government can't do to us. And one of our... God-given rights uh, that is declared in the Constitution is to assemble. That's one of our rights, mm. to assemble. And it doesn't put a cap on how many people can assemble together. And you see, these rights are not to be infringed because they're God-given. Like, just because a pandemic is happening doesn't put those rights on pause. They're not really rights then if you can just hit a pause button. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think God was also happy about that, that you weren't too concerned about and the church wasn't too concerned about that uh, uh, 50 max limit at a wonderful God-blessed celebration mm -hmm. of your guys' lives and your union and marriage. You yeah. know, So I'm proud of you for that. Um, do you mind if I go that direction? Absolutely. Okay, I, I, I want to... Uh, um, I really want to speak to the to the viewers, uh, especially the born again Christians, um, who have come to know Jesus and been filled with the Holy Spirit. If there's anybody watching this video and you think you should not get involved politically or get involved in government, um, I would really like to put the fear of God in you and change your mind that you are going to be accountable for this stewardship that you've been given as an American citizen. And uh, Chris, I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 17. And uh, it says this, Paul is preaching at the Areopagus. And uh, he has this wonderful uh, um, sermon. He meets the people right th where they're at. And that's the sermon he gives uh, where he talks about, I, I saw this uh, idol you have, or this statue you have to the unknown God. He takes advantage of that and says, I'm going to tell you about him, the unknown God that you actually have a statue to and you don't even know who he is. And he goes on to tell him about Jesus. But he says this, Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Now, Chris, I've read that scripture so many times, and when God started getting my attention, 
that it wasn't right for the governor to do what he did, I went through, God brought me to the scripture again, and it blew me away. I saw it in all new light. You know, you can read a scripture a hundred times, and then all of a sudden, boom, God turns on some type of revelation for you, and you go, oh, wow, God, you just showed me something. It says that he is made from one blood every nation of men. Aren't you glad God's not racist? Yeah. And if there's anybody that's racist watching this video, you need to repent of that sin. Because yeah. God created from one blood all man. Yeah. And then it goes on to say, He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So then it hit me, oh my goodness, Lord, America, the United States of America is really oh. pre-appointed by you and you determined what our boundaries were going to be. Hint, hint, we should be protecting our bo uh, borders, our boundaries, and paying mm -hmm. attention to who's coming through it and what's being trafficked across it, mm -hmm. you know, especially when it comes to children and fentanyl and whatever else they're bringing over. Um, and so this scripture jumped out at me and I'm going, okay, this is encouraging. America is not going to end the United States of America and what God has established in this nation is not going to end until God says so. And what has God established in this nation? We the people, right? Oh, yeah. We the people. That's what God set up in this nation. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, he goes on to say, in, uh, oh, I want to turn to Romans real quick here. Romans 13, 1. So God, we, we, we now establish God is the one who determined America. He's the one that started it. He's the one that put on the hearts of our founding fathers what to do. And that's why we should study our founding fathers and what they believed. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that are exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. And I'm just wow. going to stop right there. Um, I will ask you, and I've asked Christians this before. Who are the rulers of this country? Who are our rulers? What did God set up? We just said it. We the people. Yeah. See, when Paul mm. wrote this, it was Rome that was the authority. Okay, There was a king, and that's what God had established. Paul saw that, and, and uh, he brought it up in his sermon on, you know, in Acts 17. Mm -hmm. And here in Romans 13, he's teaching the people, God has set up uh, uh, Rome here as the authority. Um, we need to submit to that governing authority. He also taught that God is the ultimate authority. We need to submit to him first. But he taught we need to submit to, to the governing authority. Well, let me ask you this. Is Rome the governing authority over America? Mm -hmm. No. No, it's not. The governing authority that God set up in this nation is we the people. And we have a Declaration of Independence that spells that out very yeah. beautifully. We have a Constitution in the preamble of the Constitution. It declares, we the people, you mm -hmm. know. And um, God taught me during this time, we the people are the ones with whom all inherent power of government is given. And it's given to us by Almighty God. And I really hope that's turning the light on for somebody. Because if just one person watching this gets this, it's going to help change their community. It really is. It's going to help change their community. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. See, we're called to do good works. We're not saved by good works. By doing good works, we're not saved by that. But what does it say? We're saved for good works, is what mm -hmm. the scripture says. So we come to know Jesus. Jesus has got all these good things for us to do. And here, Paul is saying, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. We're the rulers of this nation. And I've asked certain Christians, who's the ruler of, of America? Oh, the president of the United States. No, 
He's the presider in chief. Presider over what? The laws of the land that come from which branch? See, we have three branches of government. Yeah. Executive, legislative, and judicial. judicial yeah. Um, the executive branch presides over the law and makes sure that the laws are executed. The judicial branch judges those laws. And unfortunately, right now, we have a lot of judges legislating from the bench, activist judges legislating from the bench, and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. What is the legislative branch supposed to do? They're the ones that are supposed to be protecting the people with the laws. Does that make sense? Yeah. And who does that? Representatives and senators who represent we the people. We the people are the rulers of America and we need to submit to that governing authority. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Absolutely. And we've lost our way. Instead, we're submitting, you know, not all of us, but submitting to a governor Walls who becomes a tyrant Walls and says, you can't have church anymore. You can't have your business open anymore. Uh, you're not essential. Um, you guys have to shut down your school. Um, I'm sorry, Governor, you don't have that authority. And you could say, well, the legislature gave him that authority. Um, here's the problem with that. We're actually not a democracy. We have democratic elections. We have democracy in our elections. But we are a constitutional republic. republic. Yep. And what that means is we have a foundation that we cannot violate. I'll just touch on the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights declares to us this right that's God given for us to peaceably assemble. We can assemble. And he was violating that no matter what the state legislature said, they would have been in violation. See, when we take an oath, when, when I got elected to the Minnesota House of Representatives, I took an oath on my first day in office to uphold and defend the Constitution, not only of the United States of America, but of the state of Minnesota as well. And that's another thing. We have state constitutions that we need to pay attention to. They're really good. And so we cannot violate that Bill of Rights, Chris. Because when we violate that, we're violating what God has ordained in our country. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Governor Walls did. What he did was evil. And we should not have been submitting to it. So he violated his oath. He violated his oath. Yep. And, and if it is true that the legislature gave him that authority, they violated their oaths. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. A little mind-blowing, isn't it? I hope I made sense there. Well, and I, I think, too, I, I love what you're saying as far as, you know, I just want to stress the fear of God is a good thing. Yeah. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. Um. And it's interesting, too, you talk about the Constitution. And, you know, I'm a Proverbs guy. I've been reading Proverbs every day for the last nine years since long term. And it's eight and nine that says, and a multitude of, a multitude of counselors, your, your plans will be established. Mm -hmm. And I look at the Constitution, and it is, and, and, you know, I'm not saying it's right there with the Word of God, because America is, Correct. you know, just a it's couple hundred years old. God. No, <laughs> but it is divinely given. Yeah. To man. I believe To that. protect our liberties. Correct. From? Tyranny. Tyranny. And that's not what God set up in America. And so he gave us the Constitution. And also, the, we need to read the Declaration of Independence. We really do. He gave us these documents. He put it on these men's hearts. And these many of these men were God-fearing men. Mm. And um, God gave them such wisdom and insight uh, to protect us from what had been going on all over the world uh, that was making two classes of people, the few elites who would live high and mighty, and then all of us peasants. And that is exactly the direction America is going in today. They're trying to cut out this class of people that is somewhere in the middle of you know the low peasantry, the, the people who don't make very much money and uh, just won't make it very far in life. And I think we all can make it far in life. We've been given that here in America to prosper. And government should be protecting that right there. People's opportunity to work hard for their hands. And are there exceptions mm. to that? Absolutely. There's exceptions in, in, the, in the Bible. The elderly, what did the Bible teach? Well, they should work hard with their hands. No, they get to an age where they can no longer work hard with their hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are to care 
for the elderly. Um, it's uh, dis disabled folks. You know, they can't. Some people are disabled mm -hmm. and can't work hard with their hands. Yeah. We need to help provide for those people. Mm -hmm. So there are exceptions to that. But here's the problem. The direction in America, and especially now in Minnesota, government is trying to become God and government is trying to become your almighty provider. Why? Because government wants to tell you how to run your life. And that's not good. If you study history, that doesn't ever end well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where we're at in Minnesota. Yeah. The government will take care of you. We saw that during the COVID, the shutdown. You know, don't go to work. We'll pay you. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, where are you getting this money from? Oh, it's federal money. Oh, where are they getting that money from? They're just printing it off. Mm. Yeah, and that's what I want to. Why I want to touch on the whole worldview issue because it's one of those things where, well, if you're not directed by what the Bible says, then there's only a couple other alternatives. You're directed by the world, their culture, which common sense says it's just failing in every direction. It's just based on greed, you know, or you're just directed by, you know, whatever. What you know, what other thing is there? You know that. The, the Bible has stood the test of time, literally. Correct. The Alpha and Omega, every book pointing to Jesus. Yeah. You know, it's stood the test of time. It has, uh, and, and two, it's one of those things where, and this is kind of a, a little rabbit trail, but, um, well, I want to talk about the bipartisanship, or if there is any in Minnesota, what you've seen. Um, and also, you know, the gospel will be preached. It will be preached no matter what. God can preach it through a rock, yeah. you know. And so um, it's one of those things where, I mean, if I was in your position, it would be so hard to just not just... Because really, ultimately, as a Minnesotan, as a homeowner in the Twin Cities here, seeing the crime, seeing the politicians uh, from the left not care at all. Not care at all. I don't know how else because actually the things that they're doing are making it way worse. Yeah. And so the only thing I could see as a fix is get the gospel in these people. Have them repent because honestly, they need to repent of the evil. Like, like what are we doing trying to, you know, send a lawsuit to Facebook Meta for billions of dollars when fentanyl is just literally being left on our streets for free for the homeless. As, as a person that ministers to the homeless, I know this. I also know that when, when a criminal is on 35W, they get off on Lake Street, the state patrol stops the pursuit. So Lake Street has become a criminal sanctuary, and yet you don't have Governor Walls talking about it. You don't have any of these people talking about it. In fact, they're focused on what's going on in Washington, D.C. They're focused on uh, endorsing city council members that are just garbage. You know, it's, I'm just, you know, the only fix I see is that these people need to turn to Jesus. Yeah. And if you just want to talk on no, that I, a little I, bit, I, is, I, is, and is there bipartisanship well, in yeah, Minnesota? Well, yeah, I was going to answer your first question. No, because there's a Democrat trifecta. They don't care. They don't care what we have to say. I mean, I couldn't even get a committee hearing. I got a, a committee hearing in the, uh, what was it? I can't even remember what it was. It was some just kind of uh, uh, cleanup bill for uh, XL Energy or something like that. Um, it's not even worth remembering. Uh, I got one, one committee hearing and it was a nothing burger. Um, it was like they were throwing me a bone and they do that just so they can say, oh look, we're being bipartisan. But anything that's actually of value no, they're not. They're not uh, bipartisan at all. Why? Why should they be? They don't care what the way our system in Minnesota is set up. The majority rules, and they've got the governor's office, which means he can sign the end of the bill. You know, he has the power to veto or to sign it into law. He then, t and this is just the way it works. He then tells them what he wants done, and they do it. The legislative branch will do whatever Governor Walls wants. He, he, I believe he thinks he's really a tyrant um, and not governing for we the people. And, um, and Governor Walls, I will tell you that right to your face. And I do love you and I do care about you. And I do ask that you would repent, that you'd turn away from this behavior and uh, seek the God of the Bible for wisdom and truth. 
Um, but uh, so you have the Minnesota House of Representatives, the majority is Democrats. You have the Minnesota Senate, the majority is by one seat, they have a majority. Hmm. And, um, and so they, don't, they didn't listen to us all session long. Uh, last year, they didn't listen to us at all, and they didn't, they didn't care. They didn't need to. Uh, but that didn't mean we didn't fight. And, I mean, that's why you see my floor speeches. Literally, the only power I had was my voice mm. because I, they wouldn't give me a committee hearing. Um, they didn't care about the bills I was writing. They didn't care about any of that. And, but according to our House rules, we get to debate in committee and on the House floor. And I even experienced it in committee. I was, uh, you can get shut down. Like the chair will just shut you down. He doesn't have to listen to you. He doesn't have to let you speak. And sometimes they would exercise that. Um, anyway, uh, no, so there is no uh, bipartisanship. Uh, and it's unfortunate. And hmm. so that's why, Chris, we had evil legislation came through. I'll just touch on HF1. We've become, in Minnesota, we're the most radical place on the face of the earth when it comes to abortion, killing children, children in the womb. We've become the most radical place on the face of the earth, more radical than uh, communist China, Minnesota, uh, more radical than California or any East Coast state as well. Uh, we are it. Um, but not only did they stop there with HF1, that was the abortion bill, um, the, uh, uh, they stuck weird stuff in there. Like it came out on the House floor. Ann New Brindley did a, a representative, Ann New uh, Brindley did a great job of bringing this out. I've got the video clipped on my YouTube channel. Um, but this bill would protect every Minnesotan. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And would Representative Katiza Watoon continue to yield? She will. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we have very different <laughs> ideas of what it means to protect. Um, but that 13-year-old girl, according to the languages in, in this bill, does that also mean that that 13-year-old girl can walk in to a facility to seek reproductive health and at 13 years old, choose to be sterilized for life. Representative Katiz Watoon. Uh, Representative, Madam Speaker, and Representative New Brindley, um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I don't know that any 13 year old would necessarily make that uh, decision. Um, But this bill does protect the rights of every Minnesotan to make their own reproductive health care decisions. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, thank you, Representative Katiza Watoon, for your honesty. You can check it out. It's about seven minutes long. Um, but she points out, according to this bill that you've written, she's talking to the, the uh, author of the bill. Is, am I reading this right? A 13-year-old girl can go into an unlicensed abortion clinic? and get sterilized for the rest of her life without her parents' knowledge or permission? And the author of the bill had to stand up and said, um, yes, this protects all Minnesotans. Then the look in your eye right now is you probably didn't know that, right? No. Right now it is legal it's disgusting. in Minnesota, a 13-year-old or a 12-year-old girl, uh, can, I, that's just the number she used, 13-year-old girl, can go into an unlicensed abortion clinic and get sterilized. You can't get that decision changed. Absolutely. And do you think 13-year-old girls make all the right decisions in life? Do you think there's ever a decision? They can't even get a tattoo. Yeah, do you th yeah, exactly. Do you think a 13-year-old girl, when she's 23 or when she's 33, looks back when she's 13 and says, man, I made some dumb decisions back then. I wish I wouldn't have done that. Well, this is a decision you can make that you could regret, and you can't reverse it. And, and that's the kind of legislation we're seeing. And I could go on. I won't. There is some real evil, wicked legislation that came through that is very perverted. And it will blow your mind if you dig into it and find out what, what's legal in Minnesota now. And, you know, ultimately, this, the whole interview series is laugh in the face of evil. And I just want to point out that what we're talking about is the reality of these people with names who have passed these bills, all this. But ultimately... This is witchcraft yeah. that was going on in the Bible, in the, in the Old Testament. 
people yeah. sacrificing their children, you know, and, and it's crazy too, because I just want to bring up really quick, um, just there's a conflict in the Middle East right now and all these people will say, oh, there's no proof, even though there's video and pictures of these, you know, 40 beheaded babies. Um, but that's a typical morning. Uh, we go up and we worship at the Robbinsdale Abortion Clinic and that's a typical Saturday morning is, you know, 35 to 50 abortions that happen in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. And so it's just a really disgusting thing, um, you know, that and these things aren't seen because, you know, they're not on the news. They're they're normalized in, in, in the politics. But but yeah, it's, it's really disgusting. And then with the other states banning abortion, it's actually increased the numbers in many in Minnesota here too quite a bit because now people come from out of state. And there's insurance companies that will actually pay for their patient the flight, the hotel stay, yeah. and everything to come to Minnesota. Yeah, and it, it is a spiritual war. I mean, if you believe, if you are a biblical believing Christian, a Bible, excuse me, a Bible believing Christian, um, you know that child sacrifice is a real thing from the scriptures. I, I believe the scriptures, and I, it's all, this is also a great history book, mm -hmm. and it's his story. And in his story, there are people doing just crazy, wicked things unto Satan. And it's empowering darkness, child sacrifice. And I believe that's exactly what's going on. And, and if you're um, a, 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 a person who's had a, a, a lady who's had an abortion, a woman who's had an abortion, I want you to know there is forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. There absolutely is. And I always want to bring absolutely. that up too. Um, you can be forgiven of murder you can be God is that merciful and he just wants you to move forward but make no mistake you will be accountable for that decision and so I would highly encourage you to turn away from that behavior get on your uh, knees before God get on your face before God and just say God I'm sorry that I did this I'm sorry that if you're if you're a lady who's watching right now and you've had an abortion just do that right now. Just confess that to God uh, through Jesus Christ and, and ask for Jesus to forgive you and to cleanse you of that. And not only will he forgive you, he'll also heal you of the guilt and the pain that that has caused in your life. Um, that, you know, Planned Parenthood is not interested in, in helping the lady with the guilt that she's dealing with after she has something no. done. They just kick, shoo him out the door, you know, move along. Who's next? And so I, I want the ladies who have had an abortion to know that, that there is forgiveness in Christ, but you will be held accountable apart from Christ, but under Christ you will be forgiven. And not just forgiven, but healed. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just want to dis demolish some of the strongholds that are out there in our, in our American culture too. You know, my body, my choice. But yet you want to force a vaccine on me. Correct. It makes no Good sense. Good night. I mean, come on. That is hypocrisy at the highest level from our highest in the land leaders also. Too. Yeah, well, but, but we're trying to protect people. See, we need to protect the people around you. Wait a minute. It, it's your job to protect me from myself, and it's your job to protect me, uh, myself, from others, and it's your job to protect others from myself. I, I'm sorry, no, you don't have, that, that means you're trying to be God. Mm -hmm. I will decide what I go out and do, who I will interact with, who mm -hmm. I will be around. If I want to protect myself, fine, I'll stay in home. I, I'll wear a mask. I'll, I'll, I'll go get a, a, an mRNA shot um, if I feel like that's what's best for me. I, I decided that that was not going to be best for me and my family, so we did not do that. Same with me. Um, but uh, no, it's like, again, it goes back to government trying to take the place of God in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that is idolatry. Yep. That is an idol. Yep. And that needs to be turned away from. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll say too, I've, I've had a couple different revelations when it comes to just the things of God and it, the deep spiritual things of God like covenant. There's a reason why you are in covenant with your wife. I am in covenant with my wife. It kind of translates even to a higher level. There's a reason we are also covenant with Jesus. We are his bride, yeah. just as we are in covenant. And so I want to say too, that transfers a lot of different biblical teachings. And as Christians, it says you will know them by their fruit. Yeah. Well, also evil, evil leaders, you will also know them by their fruit. 
Yeah. And so look at the look at the crime. We have mass lootings going on right now in Minneapolis and yeah, St. Paul. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, the the police. You know, I I know this guy. Uh, I really want to interview him soon, but he's an ex uh, MPD, and he was a canine guy, and he couldn't once everything happened with George Floyd. Yeah, we'll talk about that some other time. Once everything happened with that, he he quit, and now he's feeling the pull to get back into the force. But he needed to take some time out. And I think this year, the Minneapolis Police Department and Chief O'Hara is doing the best job he can. But I think they had eight graduates this year for new officers. Wow, that's not very many. So it's one of those things where it's heartbreaking because this is where I call my home. Yeah. Uh, you know, we hear the screams of people who are possessed, tormented by demons, yeah. you know? And, and it's one of those things where when you have evil leadership, it trickles down because there's people, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are so easily influenced by this world. Yep. And everybody with the Holy Spirit, before they were born again, they all attest to that. So yep. it's it's an obvious thing that you can see, you know. And so I just want to say that too. You will know them by their fruit, not only Christians, but also evil leadership. Yep. Because it's obvious. You see all these things happening in Minnesota and it's disgusting. Anybody with a spiritually attuned, you know, ear, just it, it, even hearing walls speak, I'm sorry, but you know somebody who's genuine to what they're doing and who's not. Yeah. And it's time that he goes out. I mean, as as a as a as a person here in Minnesota, I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted. I had a front row seat to it all session long. And it, it uh, I mean, I knew that I would be seeing evil and I knew they would be pushing evil. I just didn't know how far they would go. And let me tell you, they took it there. They went as far as they could go. And, and um, we've got another um, uh, session coming up here, um, the 2024 legislative session. And that's before the election at the end of 2024. And uh, they're just going to keep on pushing it, you know. They're going to keep on pushing their evil, wicked agenda. And um, I'm not afraid to let them know it on the House floor. I just, uh, and you know, like when, when we're in these debates on the House floor, I, I always, I don't want to just come off as angry about what they're doing because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness yep. that God requires. It gets you nowhere. I fall into that. <laughs> and I, We all get angry. That's why the, the Bible warns us, uh, be angry and sin not. Why? Because God knows we're going to get angry. It's an emotion that's actually from him. Does mm. God get angry? Yeah, but that yeah, anger is rightly placed. And that's what God wants us to do with it. He wants us to not make decisions out of anger, but rightly place it. He knows exactly mm -hmm. what to do with anger. And when we act out of anger, just pure anger, it doesn't produce what he wants done in our world. It doesn't produce good fruit. Um, and so I let anger be a motivation for me. And, and to, to, you know, anger can be a great fuel to motivate you to get involved and to get in this fight. But then I submit it to God and I say, okay, God, so when, when I'm speaking on the house floor, I, I was always praying, God, what do you want me to say? God, what do you want me to do? And then I would pay attention to what was laid upon my heart. And I would try to go with that. And I would research things as well and come up mm -hmm. with uh, facts and knowledge and, and uh, statistics because I just like that kind of stuff. But it's, God, what do you want me to say? Because that's all that's really important. That's the only thing that's going to bear fruit, God is what you want me to say. Mm. Uh, and going back to this, because literally that is the only power we had on that house floor was the power of our voice. Hmm. Wow. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this question, but sure. what are your future plans? Do you want to be a representative uh, and continue in that? Or do you have any aspirations politically in Minnesota? Well, my plan is I'm going to run for the Minnesota House of Representatives again. Uh, next November uh, so that's my plan but I always submit my plans to God um, the man may plan his steps but it's the uh, or how does, how does that I'm sorry that proverb go a man may plan his steps but the Lord directs his path oh yeah something yep. like that yeah, yeah. Um, I read Proverbs a lot so I'm sorry I, I should know that scripture right off the top of my head but um it's the Lord's plans that prevail, and so that's what I want to get on board with. But yeah, that's my future plans. I'm gonna. I want to keep fighting in the Minnesota House of Representatives. 
And, you know, uh, we'll see where God leads me. Maybe one day I will be fighting uh, for our rights in uh, Washington, D.C. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'm open to it. Um, but one thing I'm learning is that uh, as long as I stay in the, the perfect will of God, that's where you're safest. You're safest in the perfect will of God. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out where that's at, you know. And, and I, I, I don't think the perfect will of God is just this little dot on a page. I, 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 I think it's a little bit bigger than that, you know. Like, like you can get close. You can be close enough uh, to the perfect will of God mm -hmm. and get a lot accomplished. And so we'll see what God has for me. I just know... Right now, I'm serving my church. I'm serving the folks at my church, shepherding them, and I want to do that faithfully. And, and being a representative, a voice for the people of the district I serve in Minnesota, I'm very passionate about that. I love listening to the folks that I serve. Uh, God has put that in my heart. And um, I really learned at Teen Challenge, actually, to listen to people and to listen to people that you completely disagree with, <laughs> you know? But yet they're hurting people and they need someone to listen to them. And uh, But at the end of the day, I am always going to do what I believe God is directing me to do. I The people in my district, I did not hide that that's, that's who I was. They know exactly who they were getting. They knew they were getting a pastor. They knew they were getting a Christian because I made sure that they knew they were getting that because I didn't want to get the, I didn't want them to get a, a, a false bill of goods. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think if more representatives were like that, like, let's just show the people who we truly are and let them decide if that's who they want as a representative. And if we just have that attitude, it gives you a great peace. It's like, this is who I am. This is what I want to accomplish. I want to be a voice for you. I want to fight for your rights that are enshrined in the Constitution. This is who I'm going to be, and I'm not going to compromise that. Mm. Uh, the people in my district thought it was a good idea to have a representative like that. And so they tr they've trusted me to make these decisions. And um, if I do end up doing a bad job, they can hire someone else to do it. Mm -hmm. And I have a piece about that. So, How important is that, just the transparency on who you are and your, your, the engagement that your constituents have? I mean, is it, how, how important is that as a politician? Because it feels like, you know, a lot of the politicians that are in right now, it's more of a... Uh, they Power go grab. in, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's and and a um, you know, how many followers can I get on Twitter type deal? You yeah. know, I mean, I literally see these politicians tweeting these things, and it's obvious that they're I just know. trying to get a I can't stand, platform. I can't stand X, formerly known as Twitter. I, a lot of people who don't, like I, it, even though I, I still pay attention to it because there are some good things you can find on it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of posers on mm -hmm. X, there's Absolutely. a lot of posers on, on formerly known as Twitter and other social media as well. Yeah. And um, at the same time, it's a great way to communicate with your folks. Like I, I don't have a, an official Twitter account for my uh, campaign, but I do have a Facebook. And it's a great way for me to just let the folks know, like I was at Boswell Energy uh, up in Grand Rapids. I up, saw that picture of that. Cohasset. That view was beautiful. Yep, up in Co Absolutely beautiful up in Cohasset. This, this co wonderful, beautiful coal plant that uh, has wild rice growing in the river right next to it and has uh, waterfowl just everywhere and deer grazing right next to this huge pile of coal. And yet, I guess coal is absolutely destroying our environment. Um, mm. I, yeah, I didn't see that at, at Boswell. And the, the place was absolutely beautiful and clean. But I can get the word out to my constituents uh, that I serve that, hey, this is what I did today. So, you know, this is where I went and uh, got information from. And, and so I noticed, too, on that post, tool. on that post, you said that it was so clean there. It was. Know? And I just it's it, it's maybe a small thing to some people, but it's really big to me because I, I really love Philippians 4 eight when it says just focus on these things that are lovely and and honorable and all these different things. And I think it's I think it's that's an important thing in politics that even Christians in politics might miss sometimes is that people don't necessarily want to see the bad things that the other people are doing. They want to see uh, people lift up the other people in the community. And I just think that was a really interesting thing. And I, I love following you online. I follow I follow you online. Yeah, and, and that's a good point you bring up too. Like, th that's the thing. Like, um, the people on the other side of the aisle, the majority party who's pushing all this evil and wickedness, God really had to teach me. And he taught me this at Teen Challenge. I want you to love on these guys. And, you know, there were guys at Teen Challenge who would spit in your face. And yet God taught me they're hurting. I want you to love on them. 
I, I, mm. not to let them get away with bad behavior, hold yeah. them accountable, right? Mm -hmm. But love on them. Uh, rules. We were taught that rules without relationship can breed rebellion, and it's so true. Absolutely. And um, but so it's the th same thing in the Minnesota House of Representatives. My colleagues across the aisle, they're pushing this great evil, and they just can't see it. They're blind, and. Um, if they would turn to the right way, they could see it. So they are, I, again, I, I'm going to hold them accountable because they need to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. They will answer to God for what they're doing. That is a fact. Yep. And that gives me great peace. I want them to answer to God with the blood of Jesus on their account. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that to me, it's like, so it's like I need to hold them accountable and fight the evil that they're doing, but understanding the individual person is not my enemy. They've just been taken captive by the devil to do his bidding. They're captives, and I want them to be free, like I'm free. Freely have I received, freely I want to give. So where am I going with this? To still treat those people with the love and mercy of God while still holding them accountable and calling them out on their evil has been a fine line to figure out. It really has. Mm. But I know that that's the, the walk that God has called me to. Hmm. to fight what they're doing and to love on them at the same time. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, and, I, and too, I just want to just kind of circle around a little bit and just a big part of th this interview series is, is really breaking down any strongholds, demolishing strongholds by the Word of God, too. And um, I do want to talk about immigration, what you think about immigration okay. and possible yeah. even northern border, border policy, you know. Sure. Um, that's been a, a, a thing that's been coming to awareness. But when it comes to, you know, breaking down these strongholds, what the left, you know, if the left would see us, you know, you want to put the fear of God in people and you're doing a great job. And, and I believe that it, it's actually a call on God that you would even say these things. And the people that watch this, they better remember this too. You know, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just bring it to remembrance no matter what. They wouldn't be able to forget. Um, but what the left would say is, oh, separation of church and state. And you, as a pastor... And also as a Minnesota state representative, what would you say to that? Well, it's real. There is no separation of church and state. It's quite the opposite. Um, and w and that is found just in a letter. And it's in a, a personal letter between friends. One of our founding fathers writing a personal letter in response to something. Okay, you hear that? So y'all uh, that say separation of church and state, drop it. That's from the enemy. It Let's move on. Exist. And, does and not I, exist. I spoke at a church uh, up in Grand Rapids about this, and I had a, a wonderful veteran man come up. Um, he served his country well, and he came up to me and he says, geez, they've pushed this idea of separation of church and state. I thought it was actually in law. I said, no, it's nowhere in law. Let me tell you, Chris, can we touch on this? Let me, let me show you Everyone. what is enshrined. In our documents I'm just we're not even going to go into our state constitution I'm going to read you the preamble of our state constitution this is law this is what's I haven't heard this in in our state government I'm super excited I'm and I, I read it on the Minnesota House floor and I don't think some of them swore to protect this constitution uh, uh, swore an oath to protect it and they had never even heard it before I'm just going to read you the preamble which a preamble is the foundation of of the document that's coming forth. So this is the foundation of our Minnesota State Constitution. It reads, We the people of the state of Minnesota, grateful to God for our civil and religious liberty and desiring to perpetuate its blessings and secure the same, secure the same to ourselves and our posterity, so future generations, do ordain and establish this constitution. And the first thing I'll ask you is, who ordains this constitution? We, yeah. we, the people. We the people. We the people great of the state of Minnesota, grateful to God, da 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 da, do ordain and establish this constitution. So the the document, the the uh, uh, constitution of Minnesota has been ordained by we the people. We the people are the creator of it. We the people are the creator of our state government. Since when does the creation have more authority than its creator? 
It doesn't. Never. That's not how things work. Never. That's yeah. not the way it is with us and God. Never. He's creator. We don't have authority over him. He has authority over us, mm -hmm. and it's good. It's a safe place to be because he is love, and he wants nothing but the best for you and I. Yep. Government should be established to protect us, and the Minnesota State Constitution at its foundation declares to it that we're grateful to God for our civil you can't shut down my business, Governor. That's a civil right for me to provide for my family. Mm -hmm. And religious liberty. You can't shut down our church. It's my religious liberty. And desiring to perpetuate its blessings and, uh, and secure the same to ourselves and our posterity. So saying, this applies to future generations as well. We want to keep paying it forward to future generations so that they have these same liberties. And I know what the fear is. The left is really good at trying to get people fearful. Oh, you'll have chaos. No. They fear mongrel. We have chaos today because government is getting out of hand and trying to put itself in the place of God. That is always going to result in chaos. What's going to result in order? is men and women being grateful to God for their civil and religious liberty and desiring to perpetuate and secure it for future generations. That's our goal. That's what we want. We're going to protect. Yeah. And that's why they can never take away my right to carry a firearm. See, it, it, it's called our Second Amendment right. But it is a God-given right for me to be able to protect, to be the protector in my family. Um, I'm not a Christian who, if someone breaks into my home to rape and pillage my wife and children, my daughters, I have four daughters. Um, I am accountable to God if I don't protect them. If I just, well, the love, I got to show this this pillager that's breaking into my home to rape and murder my wife and children. Well, God just wants me to love on them. Um, God wants you to love on your wife and children, first and foremost. He wants you to be their protector. And he's their protector, but he also calls the man of the home, the husband, to be the protector mm -hmm. in the family. Yeah. I'm accountable to God if I don't do that. See, that is a God-given right it is a God-given right to, to have my AR-15 rifle. It is a wonderful, uh, um, um, reliable rifle. It is my right to own it. And right now we have, uh, one senator already said, next year we're going to take away their AR-15s. We're coming after the AR-15s. I will fight that tooth and nail. It's unconstitutional. It's ungodly. And AR-15 is just a highly reliable rifle. I love it. It's one of my favorite rifles. And I use it to protect my family. I also just like shooting it. It's fun. Mm -hmm. And God's okay with that. Did I answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I love the, the touch on the Second Amendment, too. It's, but the, these it's, are in our founding documents. These are the foundation. And most of our representatives in the Minnesota House and in the Senate don't even know it's there. The foundation of who we are as a state government. And Governor Walls trampled it underfoot. He spit on our Constitution. <laughs> and people need to start waking up to the fact that these are your God-given rights and they're declared to you in our federal Constitution and in our state Constitution. Our state's mm. Constitution, man, th th they've got some amazing things in them and we need to be reading them as well. Mm. God is calling us to exercise the authority he's already given us peacefully and mm. we can do that by getting involved. You know, Chris, Christians used to go to school board meetings. They used to go to county board meetings, township meetings, city council meetings. They used to get involved in local government. And that had a, um, a, a trickle-down effect on our society. And that's why for mm. a very long time, society in America was very good and very righteous. There were standards. And it's when the Christians for some reason started believing that we the people doesn't include them and they started withdrawing from government and getting involved with government man that's when things really started going haywire the word of god calls us the church the pillar and buttress of truth 
That's not me. That's actually hmm. in Scripture. Go and look it up. It's there. The church is the pillar and buttress of truth. Hmm. What's the foundation under that pillar and buttress? The Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Hmm. That's where we get our truth from. So we And if God is love, we need to be involved in government so that we can bring God's love into government. That's mm-hmm. going to bring government, or excuse me, that's going to bring order to our government. Mm. So I want to encourage every Christian watching uh, this video, this interview, please get involved at a local level. And I know it might be uncomfortable to go to a school board meeting or to go to a township board meeting or a county board meeting. But just make that first step. Go. And the more you go, the more comfortable it gets. Oh, but maybe uh, uh, there's a Thursday night football game on. Oh, that's going to, I won't be able to watch Thursday night football. Or, oh, that's my movie night. Want to know why some of the first Christians came over here, across the Atlantic to come to America and to set up it, freedom or it religion? It was the Puritans, right? To For they, freedom or religion? Yes. And part of it was they wanted the freedom to prophesy. That was just a part of it. Oh. But they wanted the freedom to prophesy. I don't know if you knew that. The that. sacrifice that they made, too, because that first winter, a lot of them died, too. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things. Uh, it, it, yeah, the sacrifice that people make. So that's another thing, too. Even if you're, even if you're afraid, if you're a Christian and, you, and your life is to the point where you can run for office and you know that you can make a difference, but you're afraid... Know that there are sacrifices to be made, but it's worth it. Absolutely. And again, while I'm not equipped to do that, I'm the perfect example of that. I didn't, I didn't go to college to become a pastor. I didn't go to college. to. I went out in the college because I was going to be a carpenter and have my own business, and I was going to be a contractor. That's what I went to school for. You want to know what happens? I dropped out like six or eight months into it because I was too busy dropping LSD. Oh. That's the truth. I was, a, I was an addict. You know, I was doing drugs. I was whatever I could get my hands on. And um, God didn't, and I even laid it out after I got saved. I said, God, do you want me to go back to college? And the answer was always, no, it's not what I have for you. Now, he may have that for others. I know there's people that God calls to go to college. He didn't call me to do that. Mm. So you are looking at a college dropout who is a pastor of a church um, that is thriving and the representative in Minnesota of District 6A, a college dropout. And so God has equipped me along the way. And I know there'll be people, you know, th- that's the thing I've been told so many times. You've got to be careful what they say. Well, no, I, I know I need to be careful what I say and what information I put out there. But truth has value. Speaking the truth has great value. And the truth is, God typically, we brought this up earlier, God typically equips the called, not the other way around. Again, sometimes he calls the equipped. Many times, most of the time, he equips as you're called. Just step out with courage and start pursuing this avenue if you're called to get involved. And I believe we as Christians, we should all be involved in government somehow at least at a local level going to school board meetings going to city council meetings going to township meetings because this is a stewardship we've been given the united states of america minnesota is a stewardship we have been given as christians and unfortunately we the christians who are part of we the people we've let it slip slip away Mm. we need to repent before god and get involved right now because it's not too late I don't wow. believe the window has closed. Wow. And, and two, I think it's, it's wise to just point out, uh, if that doesn't happen, literally, the, the ideology and the worldview that will take over if the Christians don't take over. And I'm in Ward 9, and so just look who my city council is. It, it, literally, this is an extinctionist versus humanist problem, too. Yeah. Like... These ideologies, these possible laws passed, could literally make it so people... I mean, look at abortion. How many people? 60 million or so, you know? Over 64 million, it's estimated, have been slaughtered in the womb. Estimated. And then when you pass these, you know, these different... And that's you, just in America. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when you start giving uh, hormones to children... Yeah. Uh, there's problems there when it comes later on for them to possibly have children. Or you mutilate them. 
I mean, the, this is literally he who cutting them, off yeah. the next generation. He who made them from the beginning made them male and female, Jesus said. Those are the words of Jesus. Yep. So, and that's another thing. And also, I just want to point out that yeah. Romans 1 does spell out the mind of this kind of person. Yeah. Backbiters, gossipers, inventors of, of evil, evil things. Yeah. Like, so it, it's, it's this thing where, you know, and all it takes is for good men to stand by and do nothing. Correct. And I will not stay silent in the face of evil.